It's the long one. Okay, good. Great news, everyone. I hit the record button, and that means it's another Awesomers.com podcast episode. This one is lucky number 208. So uh, it's, it's all even numbers today uh, for my special guest, uh, who's joining us in this mini-series about what do you do if you've got a product on Amazon and you've lost your ranking because you ran out of stock. There's other reasons you may lose ranking. We may talk about that uh, a little bit, but we're going to dive deep on you, you ran out of inventory. What does that mean? What are the variables involved? And is there any hope? Uh, and so I've got my buddy Tim Jordan over here. Say hello, Tim. Hi. Or er, hello. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't even follow. Oh, you got to get on. Yeah, stay hello. on plan. Yeah, we we are very rigid script show over here, as Tim knows. And so, um, okay, so we'll just start with this premise and just set the uh, level for everyone. Let's just say for the sake of discussion, you've launched a product. You've, you've been in business 30 days, 45 days, something like that. Things went pretty good on the launch, and now you ran out of stock. And for whatever reason, you couldn't get back in stock very quickly. So now 45, 60 days has gone by. You get in stock, and sales just don't come back. PPC is way more expensive. Is this a situation that you've ever seen or heard about? It seems like it's happening constantly. And the reason for that is people you know are a little bit timid on inventory when they first launch a product you know they don't want to buy six months of inventory they're hopeful but they're not going to commit that much and then things are typically you know going well if you've selected the right product and done things correctly so it's extremely rare for someone at least in my experience to launch their first product and not run out of stock this seems to be like a very very common theme through probably a couple rounds of reorders before you can get enough headway based on like actual velocity numbers and things like that so it, it happens a lot it's kind of a nature of the beast yeah it's in some ways you're just guessing right and so you have to start with the premise did you order a good product and your confidence level you know is a check mark and, and really it's more of a number one to ten uh, maybe i did maybe i didn't i don't know uh and so that confidence sets it then it's the cost of your inventory and how much capital you have you're like can i even afford as much as i my optimism suggests is that all true yeah absolutely yeah, and so once once they have that inevitable stock out, right? And by the way, it happens to everybody. Anybody who goes, oh, I never ran out of stock, let me just come and audit your books because you either have yeah. way too much stock and are completely killing your capital return or you're lying because everybody runs out of stock. It's just part of the business. And in particular, when Amazon flips the script on you with you know prime days going from two days to 30 days shipping, your sales can collapse. When your suppliers decide they're out of business for a couple of months because of COVID, you're, you know, many things happen. Air freight disappears because the cost goes up by 20 times. All of these are true variables. Have you seen some of these uh, things I've talked about here, Tim? Yeah, it's, it's also been interesting this year because we've seen some positives and some negatives that have exacerbated the problem. Because the reasons that, you know, things might have slowed down, your supply chain, your shipping, things like that, are the same reasons that more people were shopping online. So as our supply chain was slowing down, our velocity typically was speeding up. So it's like this perfect storm where the good combined with the bad creating a scenario where nobody could keep any inventory in. Yeah, it really does. It's interesting. And of course, some people were in the, the high demand essentials volume business, and then other people were in luggage and whatnot that just you know fell off a cliff, right? So that yep. it's it's not a universal thing, but clearly I think your point is at least you're online because that's where the hope lives the most. Is that yeah? Character yeah, there. I think there's a few examples of you know, like you said, luggage, but typically, I mean, it seems like eighty or ninety percent of the categories out there people started buying online more. You know, I, I can't, aside, aside from like luggage and that's really about it. I can't think of anything. Well, Even if you like, sell hotel soaps, you probably weren't getting a ton of reorders, right? <laughs> well, you probably weren't. I'm talking about Amazon. Let's just talk yeah, about Yeah, fair Amazon. enough, fair uh, enough. Yeah. But even things like they said, um, oh, school supplies, you know, because the kids aren't in school. Well, they're still buying them for homeschooling. You know, sports, the kids aren't playing soccer. Well, they're outside playing with their siblings now, you know? So yeah. it's like, it's like the majority, I think it's a fair statement to say the majority of everything increased velocity, you know, except for a few outliers. Well, and just the baseline alone of whatever the category was, plus the COVID increase is enough to, to send the numbers north. And then 
it's it's a catch as catch can when it comes to who's in stock, right? Because when yep. you're out of stock, then they buy somewhere else. Yep. That drives velocity, drives a whole bunch of other things. So let's let's talk about one of the the topics that is uh, that comes up, and it was part of this mini series. I'm talking to a lot of experts about this. Um, when you run out of inventory, is there anything that you should do to kind of preserve and protect your position, or just kind of rush to get inventory? And what, what's your stance? So to preserve and protect my position, I actually start start activating my plan before I run out of inventory. Now, what I'm about to say is a little bit controversial. There's a lot of people that tell me I'm absolutely crazy for this, but there's also a lot of people that actually sell and have done this and and agree with me that it's true. I think that I'm going to make some generalized statements. Right? I know there's exceptions. Generally, Amazon wants to sell stuff. They do, right? True. And when you run out of stock, I think that Amazon wants to put you in a position to sell if you were selling before you're out of stock, after you come out of stock. So Amazon likes to have a placeholder, right? Now, I think that there is a misconception between rank and page placement. And when I see myself, my own products, people in my coaching program run out of stock, their BSR will decline, right? Or increase, however you want to say it. But that doesn't it necessarily worse. mean that, that's it, the it, point. it gets, it gets worse. worse. It gets yeah. worse. But there's a lot of variables and a lot of reasons for that. There could be other listings coming online in that broader category, things like that. But what I'm noticing is if you have a fairly decent selling product, if you go out of stock, when you come back in stock, as long as it hasn't been a, a, a you know absurd amount of time, if it's less than 60 days, I'm not seeing much decline in page placement. And to be honest with you, I don't look at BSR. I don't, I don't care about BSR. There's too many fluctuations. I look at page placement. So if I'm selling this, which is one of my first products I ever sold, mm -hmm. for emergency car hammer, like I don't care about the BSR, but if, I, if I'm selling well and I stock out, when I come back in stock, Amazon knows that if this was selling well, they have a vested interest to put me back up where I was. Because if all they're doing is swapping me for someone that's, you know, has less reviews, doesn't convert as high, doesn't have as high a click through rate, they're losing out on sales, right? Because they make money on that 15%. So I think that all, although Amazon's algorithm is flawed, generally they want to put the better selling products higher on page placement. And they determine that by sales velocity and conversion rate. Okay. So bear with me. I'm, I'm walking you through a string here. Yep. No problem. So I'm uh, taking I, notes. So I, so I firmly believe that when you stock out, your velocity and your conversion rate are massively important. Okay. So there's a lot of people that say, oh, the worst thing you can do in the world is, is stock out. So increase your price, turn off your PPC, all these things to slow yourself down. you like, you can stretch out. If, if I'm going to come back in stock on February 1 and it's January 1 and I've only got two days left of inventory, they say slow things down and try to stretch it out so that the amount of time you're out of stock is less. I hate that philosophy. And the reason is because you're tanking your conversion rate by jacking your price up. You're tanking your click through rate because people are less likely to click on it and you're tanking your velocity. So when you stock out, your position is not as good as where it was. So for me, I tell people like if I'm going to drive off a cliff, I'm going to hit the gas and I'm going to launch this sucker as far off the cliff as I possibly can. So not only do I keep my velocity exactly where it was, sometimes like in the, if I have 30 or 40 units left, one or two days worth of stock on particular products, I'll even decrease my price a little bit right before I stock out just to give myself a little bit higher velocity and then boom, stock out. I feel like that helps when I come back in because Amazon says, Hey, they, they've been out of stock. Things happen, but man, they were selling 50 units a day. We'll make more money having them back on page one, put me back on page one. Right. right so, so I'll actually hit the gas more before I drive off that cliff. So to dive into your Thelma and Louise strategy a little bit more, uh, yes. that part of that it, uh, presumes, and uh, I think there's some prevailing wisdom out there and logic that says Amazon tracks the trailing time periods, whether it's trailing seven days, trailing, 21 days to 28 days, you know, yeah. there's these trailing periods and how you're trending during those various periods is part of the A9 algorithm. I also think it's part of the pay-per-click uh, auction method. Yeah, What's absolutely your thoughts? Agree. Yeah. Yeah. Because like I said, as screwed up as some of their systems are, they want to sell stuff. So yes, they're, they're going to look at performance, right? 
if I, and, and another thing that Amazon sellers like to do is think of themselves as Amazon sellers. I hate this. Like we have to stop being Amazon sellers and start being product sellers. But think about this. If I have a name brand like Nike, you know, Nike shoes, do you think that if they run out of stock on a, on a particular SKU for two months, that they're going to get buried on page 60? No, it's a Nike shoe. Like Amazon knows that if it was selling well, they want it back up there, right? And we don't think of ourselves like we think of the big brands because we're just private label sellers, Amazon sellers, right? Quit doing that. If you have a product that's selling and you're making money, Amazon's making money. They have a vested interest in you continuing to sell that product. So how much of the variables that relate to this uh, have to do with the, the length of the product from launch to stock out? Let, let's say, you know, the thing's been around for three years. We got a stock out. Um, does that come back easier than, hey, I just launched this thing and 45 days later I'm out of stock? Does that history matter in your opinion? I think that the history matters, but there may be additional variables too. Clearly. Right? So, uh, what others? So things like reviews, right? Like how many reviews do we have? How many other ad placements and ad locations? Because this is a brand new launch. We probably haven't set up DSP. We probably haven't set up EBC or A plus or whatever you want to call it. I would like it. to get some more acronyms in there, please. <laughs> exactly. We'll work on that. <laughs> um, so you can't compare apples to oranges. Like you can't say that a recently launched product in your first round of a thousand units is going to behave and respond the same as something that's been in stock for three years. But I still think that it's fair to state generally you want to have your tailing. I, I like the term you use tailing edge or tailing end or whatever. Yeah, the it was. trailing uh, time periods, trailing 12 trailing months, trailing period, most, one month, yeah, whatever. Most recent as positive as possible, right? As positive as possible. Don't turn off your PPC, none of that stuff. So now, that's, that's like your scorecard. Hey, listen, I, uh, I'm going uh, summer abroad because I'm out of stock. But when I left, I was getting A plus, A, you know, I went from C to B to A. I'm trending the right way. You're saying that that, that memory, the, the multiple algorithms see that and go, this is a good bet when they come back in stock. That's your premise, yes? I agree. Now you agree with some, yourself. Wow, well done. All right. I will agree. Yes. <laughs> yes. So there are some other variables. Um, one there are some other considerations. Sure. One is I don't think that an extended period of out of stock will respond the same way. Okay. Right? Give me a well, yeah. break it down between the times you think. So, so I've noticed long. about the same performance up to about 60 days. If you're out of stock a couple months, that's fine. But people that are out of stock four, five, six months, it responds much differently. So there's two things that I think need to be considered. One is um, if it's going to be six months, you don't really know if it's going to perform well or not. So you really have to just test it. And I know this is terrifying. So I recently relaunched something, something that I was in the same scenario. I was out for five months. And this, I didn't have a ton of reviews. I had like 40 reviews. And I knew going into this, restock that one of two things is going to happen. One is Amazon is going to give me fairly decent placement. Let me work my way back up page one or two on the keywords, whatever. The other thing that could happen is Amazon could have buried this thing in history. Now, once I've sent these products into Amazon, I've committed, right? Yeah, and Amazon, because they're logistics, yeah, their logistics this year have been so slow. Um, I've been utilizing three PLs more and more often. So what I did is I actually kept my stuff in three PLs and I shipped in a very small number to Amazon. This is about three weeks ago. And I shipped it back in. I've been out of stock for like five and a half months. Um, got some inventory in. It started responding really, really well, right? I got lucky on this one. If it had not responded well, I would have stripped the few remaining units that I had in back to my three PL. And I actually would have created a new listing. Now, the way I would have done this is I would have created a variation on that listing and basically relaunched, right? Like I, I don't necessarily buy into quote unquote the honeymoon period like as a magical thing, mm -hmm. but Amazon does give you the benefit of the doubt, right? They're not gonna bury you at the bottom of the stack. They're gonna put you somewhere in the middle on keyword placement. Again, not ranking, not BSR, forget all that, but on keyword ranking, they're gonna put you in the stack and see how you do, right? So relevancy to a specific set of keywords, you're saying, that the, the urban legend of the honeymoon period may not be, uh, it's more tempered in your view. Is it tempered based on time or, or how would you characterize the honeymoon period or does it not exist at all? So uh, 
I, I even hate the term honeymoon period because people think it's like so magical. This is where you can rank faster. I don't think that it's a faster rankability period. I think it's better initial placement. If you do poorly, you'll decline. If you do well, you'll increase. But you're put in a fairly good benefit of the doubt position, right? Yeah. So, so it's, it's not ranking. It's discovery. You you have the potential discovery. to be discovered Again, higher than. I know before. this sounds crazy. I have not looked at BSR in two years. It is no, the most know. overused, overcomplicated, and overassumed metric on your Amazon listing. It doesn't matter. Page placement, page placement, page placement. That's all that matters on a specific set of keywords. So this is not a product. This is 15 products, and all of those products are based on individual keywords. So when I'm thinking about relaunching something, if I run out of stock, where is my placement going to be on all 15 keywords? Because I'm selling the keyword, not a product, right? right. That's right. So, so, so that being keyword said, relevancy. Let me let me just make sure I, I um, keep it all concise and and dialed in for the the group out here. When you look at this, you're saying that, you know, first of all, you, you, you made a couple things that were important and I don't want to miss this. You said, hey, looking back at it, I might have just relaunched that thing instead of trying to re-rank it. And part of that relaunch is this increase in discoverability. You're not willing to go so far as honeymoon period, but you are saying there's some higher level of discovery in this uh, preliminary period. Is that fair to say? Correct? That is accurate. Yep. Okay. And then from there, you said... Um, you know, it's, it's about keyword relevancy. So individual keyword being relevant to your listing and where those things are ranking that will ultimately decide if you are uh, making sales or not. Is that also characterized, right? That that's characterized correctly. Yes. On, on multiple levels, but it, man, we could get in a deep rabbit hole there if we're not careful. So <laughs> let's, just, let's just go back to the, the relaunch thing. Please. What I don't want to do is lose those reviews. So let's say I have 50, 70, 100 reviews. What I don't right. want to do is lose all of those reviews, but I may need to kickstart this thing and tell Amazon, hey, this is somewhat of a new product. So I have found, and I know some categories don't work exactly the same way. Some are better, some worse. But generally speaking, all right, in your more general common categories, if I create a new variation, a lot of times that variation, and I've tested this by like keeping a few of these in stock and then creating a new variation with a different FN SKU, different listing. And the variation will come up on page two after a few days of a pretty long tail keyword where this is still on page nine, right? Uh, yeah. So I know that the variation will outperform, you know, or independently perform. I won't say outperform, but independently perform. Now what I'll do is then I'll start sending in all my inventory. I'll pull the inventory out the other variation. And now I'm just restocking my second variation, right? And then once I get that in and we get rolling, then I will merge the two variations um, through various different ways, depending on what categories and how deep you have to go to try this. But basically, um, for simplicity's purposes, I'll go to Amazon and say, hey, there's a goof up here. If you look at both of these listings, one out of stock, one is in stock. Um, they're actually the same thing. Look at the pictures. Can you merge these? This is a mistake, a catalog mistake. You know, Then they'll sure. usually merge it for you. Now you've got your reviews. So. I will do that if, if I can't regain or retain or reset some of the existing velocity and stuff that I had prior to stocking out on the list. And in some cases, some categories, I think still the variations and the parent or the, the variations or children under the parent will often cross show the, the review. So, yeah. you know, so you have to necessarily merge them. Yeah, you're bringing out the 2020 version. Uh, it's not powder blue anymore. It's sky blue. It's got a different code, a different this, a different that. I would change some of the pictures, even if you just reverse some of these things. Just yep. ch changing enough things in the listing so it does appear to be a fresh enough thing that avoids some of that, uh, uh, you know, variation manipulation uh, concept. And then fundamentally, you don't sell them against each other long, right? Uh, no, you no, want to no. make sure that you make, yep. bet on the winner, right? Yep. And so, so, yeah, keep going. So an, another thing that I'll do when I launch this thing is keeping in mind that Amazon wants my performance to be high, right? They want my velocity, they want my conversion rate, they want. One thing that I'll do is I will often suppress my listing as inventory is coming in. Because if I send in a case of 200 of these, that one case is gonna go to one fulfillment center and they're gonna keep 10 and they're gonna ship everything else off everywhere, right? Now, the problem with that is one, what if those first 10 sell? My listing goes on and off, right? 10 sell on and off. 
And then also that listing can pop up in different regions. So if I've got 100 units in New York, people in the zip codes that can be reached within two days of New York, they might get that listing shown. People on the West Coast might not. I'm, sim I'm simplifying this. So what's happening is while your listing is going, your listing is active in certain regions, but it may only be viewed by half of the country. Yeah. So your click-through rate and your, your click-through rate may be okay, but your number of clicks and your velocity is going to be decreased, right? So what I hate is uh, two sales out of stock, two sales out of stock the next day, the next day, three sales, when I should be getting 30 sales. So what I'll frequently do is suppress my listing by removing the number one picture. And the reason I don't close or pause my listing is because a lot of times Amazon will stop the fulfillment and distribution. They'll like put a pause. So I've seen that if you suppress it, Amazon will continue to distribute it. Then I'll wait till I have a large number in fulfillment centers. Like I don't have a ton in FC transfer inbound, pop that picture and boom, everything goes live all at once. And within that first day, if I've done my job right and I have my PPC on and activated and all that stuff correctly, then I'll get 20 or 30 sales that day as opposed to two. So yes, I'm waiting sometimes a week more, sometimes 10 days more until my, my products get distributed. But for me, what I'm finding and, and you know, some of my students in my, uh, my coaching program, what we're finding is, so I say that just to say it's not a fluke, like there's a lot of us testing this thing, is that typically when we pop back in, we have a lot better performance in this slow roll and Amazon trying to figure out if we're legit or not. You know? So uh, this is all good. And I, I mean, I like those, uh, those tactics. I think they make sense. Uh, what we got on this uh, point, and, and there was a secondary element to this, which was, you know, 60 days or less, I'm going to try to re-rank it or maybe even relaunch it, um, you know, based on the account of reviews, based on various things. But it seemed like you were alluding to the idea that if you're out of stock for a longer period than that, then it's tougher sledding. And maybe there's not a choice between re-ranking and relaunching. Is that, am I reading yeah, so it right? To, well, and, and I answered that, maybe I, maybe I didn't frame it correctly. If it's less than 60 days, I'm just going all in. I'm going back where I was. I'm, I'm putting it all out there. Okay. If it's longer than about 60 days, that's when I'll do that that's test. That's the relaunch. Okay. That's when I'll try it. If it doesn't immediately work, put the kibosh on it, set up a new variation and essentially relaunch. And how much time do you give it to give that, um, that, that, you know, let's, let's just say for the sake of discussion, if, it's, it's, my test. 50 days. Yeah. And yeah. now you've got a test period. You don't know if it's, yeah. you know, you're right on that borderline. How do you know if, when the if test things is are working correctly? I'll know within four or five days. When I say things are working correctly, I'm indexing for the keywords that I should. So like two times a day index checker, like am I indexing and also are my PPC ads running? So if my PPC ads aren't running and sometimes it takes your PPC ads a little while to get ramped up. So usually I'll turn this thing on and I'm usually indexing immediately, but my PPC takes like 48 hours to get ramped up. Yeah. So once it gets ramped up and I see that I'm getting impressions and I'm making sure to bid a little higher just to make sure, you know, a competitor didn't come in and outbid me. That I didn't realize. Um, once that kicks in, then I'll give it four or five days. If I'm just completely sucking it up and I'm still on page 12 for all the keywords I want and like my PPC ads are not converting um, or I'm getting lower impressions than I think I should, that's when I'll like, I'll kill it and I'll relaunch this thing. Yeah, I got you. Now, what is the effect of PPC when this happens? Is, uh, is the ACOS whole level when you come back into stock? Does it go up, down? What, what's your opinion about that impact? I think that it, it, it holds the cost per click should hold level unless you have more competitors. You know, when you come back in stock, if everybody's outbidding you, it's supposed to go up. Now, your A cost will go up because you're going to have less organic sales. You know, you are. Even yeah. if you retain a lot of position, you still may be in position eight on page one where you want to get back into position two. Like, it's just going to take a while. So your A cost will go up. But again, that's, that's relevant to time. So give a little bit of time, get your organic sales going and make sure, you know, you don't freak out with that high A cost. Now, the reason PPC is important is because PPC is the only thing, the only variable that I control, can control for which keywords I want, okay? Right. So if I just list this thing on Amazon, it should hypothetically be showing me for everything it's indexed for, which could be a thousand keywords, right? But I have no control over which one of those keywords I wanna focus on. So again, when it comes to page position, ranking on a page, not ranking BSR, but ranking on a page, 
uh, relevancy is massively important because I feel like conversion rate, click-through rate are important. So if somebody's looking for a car accessory, is this a car accessory? Yes. Sure. But if I'm running PPC for car accessory, nobody wants this. People looking for steering wheel covers and bumper, you know, those those bull nuts that hang from your hitch, you know, behind the truck. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's all that I was stuff. just doing a search for that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's not it's not super relevant. So I don't want to be targeting car accessory yet because you know, point zero 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 two percent of the people that see this actually click on it. So my click-through rate sucks. And then my conversion rate sucks. So Amazon is showing it to everybody, going, oh, they don't want it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna target the keywords using PPC and just exact match. Sometimes I'll stretch it out to broad, but generally exact match, no auto, nothing. Emergency car hammer, car hammer for emergencies, emergency glass breaking hammer, ham or glass hammer, windshield hammer, um, you know, all those very specific keywords. Now, am I gonna be shown a million times as if I was running a PPC ad for car accessory? No, but I don't want that. I don't wanna be shown a million times and never get any click because Amazon says nobody wants this crap. Right. right. And if yeah, they are the, clicking on it, they the may not. The impression to click ratio is very yeah, important it's to Amazon. Terrible. The the so you start underperforming. So start small, start very, very direct, get your relevancy honed in. And then Amazon will say, oh, this, this thing sells when we show it, it sells. And they'll start moving you into higher positions for those other broad keywords you don't have to pay for. So for me with PPC, when I come back and play, PPC is like the most important thing that is on the Amazon platform to specifically tell Amazon where I want to be shown to directly impact the metrics like conversion rate, click-through rate, right? Which I think are more important than velocity at that time period because uh, like I was consulting for a company once that um, they were using, I hate to call out names so I won't, but it was a software company that started a T near the Ecometrics. And uh, oh, good. Oh, I'm glad uh, we kept yeah, it nice I and bet. big there. Very, very and well uh, <laughs> you know, the metrics of, of their software was like how many sales are they are getting and, and how many, uh, you know, what's their A cost. But then when I opened up other columns and look, I, we were doing that, like their click through rate was like 0.00004% for these keywords. And they weren't like, they had, this is a costume company. It's a company called Elope. They had the license for Harry Potter costumes. They're the only ones. So if I search, if I search Harry Potter necktie or Hogwarts something, they're the only ones selling it. But if I typed Hogwarts necktie, their Hogwarts necktie in the title was on page three. Wow. And there's all this other bull crap on page one and two. Yeah. And they're like, why is this happening? I'm like, because nobody's paying attention to conversion rate. <laughs> Amazon hates when you have a crap. You're showing it to everything. You're running ads for Halloween costume and slutty nurse costume because it is a Halloween guy, but no one, no one's looking for a slutty nurse costume with a Harry Potter tie, you know, like it, it just doesn't make yeah. sense. Insanity. Relevancy actually matters. It's, Relevancy matters so freaking You may as well much. just burn that up in a Tika torch. Uh, so <laughs> the, the, the question then is, I saw what you did there. Yeah, I, I like that. It's a subtle yeah. one. It's for the advanced <laughs> players. Uh, awesome. Yeah. If you got that joke at home, go ahead and leave a five-star review right now. <laughs> um, all right. So, as we look at this, we know that relevancy. So I think you and I agree with the premise that Amazon is a search engine for products, it is. right? Yep. People go there, they type in what they want. Rarely do they navigate to what they want. They're searching for what they want. They find basically what Amazon wants on the front, which is a bunch of ads. They squeeze in a few products still, but it's going more and more ads editorial suggestions yeah, and all, yeah. this crap. all of that's yeah. that's all of that is controlled on some way or will be controlled in some way by money at some point so how important is well you've clearly made it important that ppc must be focused on must be exact match for a specific set of keywords and that the budget is it higher or lower than it used to be because your a cost you said got worse because you're not making those organic sales so how much extra should you expect to spend and for how long and it depends. It depends on how competitive those keywords are. It depends on the search volume of those keywords, which will directly, you know, tie into how competitive it is. Sure. But if I pay 50% more for the first two weeks, I'm fine with that, right? My daily budget, my cost per click, whatever. Now I should see that stuff start to come back down. And just because I'm willing to bid 50% more or pay up to 50% more a day, doesn't mean I actually will. But the truth is, as much as we like to beat up on Amazon, they built this system for us that 
you know, is pretty stinking awesome when you really think about it. But it's their system. And I feel like, and, and again, I can't put this on a pivot table and show you this, but I feel like when I'm willing to pay more for a bid and I'm willing to show Amazon some love, Amazon's more willing to show me some love. If I'm always fighting, you know, like, oh, I don't want to pay a dollar twelve per click, I want to pay a dollar. So I'm going to keep my bid at a dollar and I'll stay on the bottom of page one instead of top of page one. But but that's my like concession that you know, just pay a buck thirty, like just do it. If your product has such slim margins, you can afford to pay a dollar instead of a dollar thirty. You got the wrong product. That's not like the problem isn't you can see the problem is your product. But pay a little bit more. Show them that you're going to show them some love, and hopefully they'll show you some love too. So I I, I definitely using PPC pay to play. Yeah. So without question, PPC has to be part of the strategy for recovery. Are there other tactics or things that should be considered at the point you come back in stock and you choose? to re-rank this product, is there anything else people should be considering or should it just be solely focused on PPC? So I think PPC is number one. I think that inventory stability is number two. So like I said, um, and a, even availability um, stability. I've never said those two words together before. Yeah, but availability, I, I like it. It's stability. a good course, yeah. When I was talking about uh, suspending my listings so that things are in, I think that's an important matter. And then if I am not ranking well for specific keywords, sometimes I'll show those keywords love through like search find buys, yeah. right? So I'll do some of that stuff. The other thing that I'll frequently do is drive some outside traffic, especially if I was doing outside traffic previously. So if I was running Pinterest ads to my product, by God, you better keep those Pinterest ads back on as soon as you come back in your inventory. Um, if you were doing something like using Amazon affiliates, Make sure that they know you're back in stock. Because if you're out of stock for six months, I promise you they took your links down, right? So you need to make sure that if you can track that, so if you can find them, go back in and, hey, look, I ran out of stock. It sucked, COVID, whatever. It won't happen again, I promise. Put my link back on your blog, you know, and get that love going. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's good advice. So for those, uh, Tim mentioned this earlier, but I want to just point this out. You know, he says, hey, you know, the difference between spending a buck or a buck 12 or a buck 30 don't get caught up in those details, but he's, he alluded to the idea that you actually know how much you can spend on your cost per acquisition, which many of you may not. So I want to just remind people and go to empowery.com slash ROI, and you can do an impressions, click through, you know, leads, customers uh, to find out your, your cost per acquisition, to find out what your cost per customer is. You can find out your, if you click on the advanced world, you can find out the lifetime value of your customer if they happen to buy more than one time without knowing the lifetime value, assuming it's a recurring purchase, or the cost per acquisition, you are not in a position to make good ROI uh, choices when it comes to PPC. Is this a philosophy, knowing your numbers, so that uh, you can agree with him? It, it is. Um, I will say also keep in, keep in mind short-term numbers and long-term numbers. Good point. Right? Yeah, right. So, so what is that? You're, what so you're I'll give an saying. Extreme, yeah, go ahead. I'll give an extreme case. Mm. People that are selling things like superfoods and supplements for a $15 bottle of spirulina algae, they might be paying $6 a click. Okay. All right, do the math there. $6 a click for a $12 bottle. Does that make sense? Yeah. You, <laughs> hey, not no. unless you sell every, every click, which you don't. Exactly. And um, until? Until you start getting organic sales, right? So keep in mind that short term, there are scenarios where you want to lose money or you're perfectly happy losing money per sale or with your ACOS or 600% ACOS. If strategically, you know that by doing that after a certain period of time, you'll get enough organic sales to make it worth it. So for every $6 click purchase or click, you might be getting 60 organic sales as well. So again, pay to play um, short term, long term. Sometimes you're paying just to get your sales going in velocity. Now, generally speaking, that's not the case. You're going to find that with mega competitive things like uh, superfoods, supplements, skincare, some electronics, things like that. But for most just everyday products, um, using that ROI calculator that, uh, that Steve's got um, is definitely worth it. And I typically will be happy breaking even on a launch. So if I'm launching a first break thousand even units be nice. yeah. and, and I break even, man, I'm like, I'm That's juicy. perfectly yeah. happy. I, I would like that myself, I, although I can't say that it's uh, entirely, um, well, it just depends on the competitive nature of that particular uh, product or category. 
Uh, and also bear in mind, everybody, that the, the lifetime value, right? If you're selling those supplements, they don't care about spending $20 to get a $12 customer if they know that their average customer is going to order eight times, right? Because it, yep. now it is, you know, eight times 12. So they're, you know, they're getting $96 on that $20 yeah. CPA. And it, people that are using subscribe and save or their right. listings are offered in subscribe and save, they're paying obscene amounts for PPC clicks. The, uh, I was listening recently to something, the Genius Mushroom guys. Mm. Have you seen this product? No, I'm not familiar. It's called Genius Brand Mushroom Supplement. It's really, really cool. Uh, at least their marketing is. At one point, <laughs> their cost per acquisition, uh, talking about how many sales they got actually for how many clicks and the sure. cost of clicks, their cost per acquisition on Amazon was like $61. Yeah, giddy up. $61. But the, like 40% of the people were doing subscribe and save. And wow. then a lot of the people that, so of that 60%, a very high majority were still reordering. And Amazon knows that that's a, a commodity. It's something that's uh, replenishable. So Amazon starts pitching them ads too. Like Amazon will target you for replenishables more so than car hammer that you're going to put in your glove box and forget. Um, and those by guys the way, for like, those who are falling in love with the idea that Tim has this uh, past product, uh, uh, my brother did one of those one time and got a, a patent takedown notice. I don't know if it's a real patented item or not, but uh, somebody was somewhere was watching those car hammers. So I don't know if you still do that or not, Tim, but be aware. Uh, for anybody, that, that's interesting. Of, by by sending out all those fake patent notifications, I didn't. It worked. Well. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but your point about the mushroom guys is they knew their cost per acquisition may be high up front, but they knew their what they should expect on subscribe and save. They knew what they should expect for reorders and that Amazon halo effect of, hey, these guys sell again and again to people. Let's keep retargeting. And Amazon does a lot of that themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's for sure. So. All right. So what we kind of say is there's hope. If you ran out of stock, there's hope. You may have to pivot between a relaunch or a re-rank, um, but you should focus on pay-per-click, uh, lever in some of the other things like external traffic, whether it's Pinterest or the, the gram, because I'm cool. I say the gram. The gram. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I know. Against all odds, I'm the hip you're, and with it. You're going to have all these gals sliding into your DMs after this episode. Yeah, well, I tell you, I, I'm, it's blowing up. It's uh, Over here, it's blowing up, everybody. My DMs have been slid into. Uh, <laughs> I think that's the way you say it, right? Yeah, right? Sure. Listen, I was, uh, earlier I was lit. Uh, that's what I was told. I was lit. Yeah. I would I say lit AF. Well, there you go. That's that's like lit plus, as far as I can tell. Uh, so, um, any key takeaways, uh, Tim, in, in terms of uh, you know what people should expect if they face this? Uh, should they uh, you know have hope, I, not hope? What, what's your deal? Yeah, I'll, I'll 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 be a little bit broader, like psychologically here. Look, it's going to happen. It happens to everybody. Um, if you guys followed the Project X case study I did with uh, Helium Tim. I can't say how many times we've run out of stock and the whole world's watching. Like, it just happens. Um, keep in mind, this is a marathon and not a sprint. So the little hiccup of, oh crap, I ran out of stock for six weeks and now like, what am I going to do for the next three days? Those next three days are not like survival or failure, or failure of you as a person. Like marathon, not a sprint. These things happen. Uh, just take each one of them, you know, um, with the appropriate amount of response, don't freak out. Don't overreact. Keep in mind that little things are going to happen. You're not going to index your, your PPC is not going to show up for 48 hours. Like don't completely lose your mind over this, right? This is something that happens tens of thousands of times a day and people figure it out. And there's a lot of smart uh, resources, guys like Steve, you know, um, resources like this podcast, like Empowery, like there's communities of people that have been through this, like, and can talk you off the ledge if you're freaking out. Right. But there's always a solution. It might not always be what you want, but there is always a solution. There's no point in like throwing in the towel, giving up, losing faith. Like there's ways around all of it. Yep. No, I think that's well said. Uh, if, if the folks are looking for you, uh, maybe they, maybe they want to slide into your DMS. I don't know, but, uh, how do they find you, Tim? Where are you in the world? Uh, find me on private label Legion. Look, I'm wearing the shirt. Private okay. Label. He's on brand there, everybody. Private um, label Legion. It's not, it's not intentional, but, uh, yeah, I've got a Facebook group, uh, private label Legion, or you can just look me up. I'm on all the social channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, 
all that good stuff. But Tim, Jordan, Tim Jordan. And by the way, for those who aren't watching the video version, you missed that the the guy on the shirt has like this really cool mohawk. Can I see that again? Is that uh, Is mohawk or a mullet? I'm not sure. Well, either way, it's pretty sweet. And uh, yeah, you're going to want to get you some of that swag, if nothing else. Uh, and, you know, Tim is uh, very dedicated to sellers. He's done a lot of uh, coaching and, and trips and sourcing, and he's, he's been around the block a, a couple of times. And so, uh, you know, reach out to him. You said Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera, Instagram yeah. DMs. Good. You know, I'm, I'm really not on the gram. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I'm, That's you know, shame. now, now everybody's talking about all these other parlor and me, we, and I yeah, mean, that's right. Yeah. I, 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 I haven't even thought about it. People are like, are you jumping? I'm like, man, I haven't even, I don't even know what telegram is. And Instagram is like <laughs> three years in my future. Like I'm just old school. I'm going to stick out with <laughs> emails and face the book face. Well, I, I got the uh, Blackberry over here, and I'm uh, sending telegrams to my uh, my next door neighbor. So yeah, gotcha. Uh, and, he, and he's answering it on his jitterbug. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a top technology show here, everybody. Now, <clears throat> I've already called for the uh, the five star reviews before in this broadcast, but I'm going to double down on it. This is the time. Now that you've heard the goods, now you owe me. So uh, I'm going to do a, a little bit of a a sweet please leave a five-star review. And then I'm going to do the other one, which is if you don't leave a review, I will find you. I've got a particular set of skills and I will make you leave that five-star review. That's how serious I am. And mostly it's just for fun. I like to collect them and then lord them over my children about how cool I am. And if you don't understand that, you're not a parent. All right. So <laughs> Tim, do you agree with that five-star review? Could not, uh, could not agree more. Yep. You appreciate the threats as well? Uh, you know, I appreciate the threats, and frankly, I'm a little bit terrified. I'm I'm already figuring out like how do I leave a review because yeah, yeah, I don't want well, Steve sliding my DMs. Listen, a... I'm going to be Liam Neeson all over these guys with the uh, particular set of skills, and mostly, I'll be honest, the skills. A spoiler alert here: it's mostly just begging. It's just please, please, I'm yeah, it's, begging you. It's like a combination of pity and a little yeah, bit of right, right. It's like, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Come on, give a brother a break. Uh, but still annoying, annoying enough to get you to act. That's the point. So thanks, Tim, for taking the time out. I really mm -hmm. appreciate you. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for putting all this together. I'm sure that uh, somebody has heard something that's going to help them, and that makes it worth it. No doubt about it. Well, this mini series, uh, you know, we'll probably get a couple more of these done, and then everybody will have all the opinions uh, from all the the uh, tastemakers, as it were, in the the community. Uh, awesomers, we will see you next time. This is awesomers.com slash 208, episode number 208 in the can. Until next time, everybody.